Welcome to the second episode of the Raise the Bridge podcast. I am your host, Phil Scrasso. It's taken me a little bit of time to get this second episode all finished up. I've been in the studio uh, working on a deluxe edition for Shape by Fire, uh, the latest Asley Dying record came out two years ago. It's sort of a two-year anniversary release comprised of a few live tracks, some reworkings, reinterpretations of a few songs, uh, a few new songs. The new song, Roots Below, which recently came out that you can find streaming on all streaming services. My guest today is a buddy of mine, Taylor Young, who used to play drums in the band Nails, and he currently plays in a number of bands, Twitching Tongues, plays guitar in that God's Hate, Criminal Instinct, and he has his new band, Zeus, spelled Z-O-U-S. He's also got his own studio. You can go to thepitrecordingstudio.com for more information. And uh, I initially met Taylor at his studio. Uh, he worked on a record of mine, a uh, side project called Poison Headache. And from there, Taylor had asked me to fill in for Nails for a few shows. So I played, I think, six shows with them back in 2016. So that's kind of the history of um, how we got to know each other. You can find Taylor on Instagram at TaylorXYoung. And like I said, the pit recording studio.com. All right, here we go. What have you been up to during the, the COVID crisis? Still working on records here and there, a lot of mixing, doing some writing. Not many bands able to come in? or uh... I've had a few. Yeah. We just kind of keep masks on and stuff like that. We had a, a little scare with actually my own fiance at her work. Somebody near her got tested positive, and so I told the band I was with, and we all got tested. But it ended up being that the positive that got picked up was... A false positive but you mentioned to me before that you get tested every two weeks yeah so. just try to keep it regular i feel like we're going to be doing that for a few months maybe a year it's good to just know in that moment even though you could walk out of the testing place go to the grocery store and fucking catch it are you seeing any like family or uh, i see my mom and my brother that's pretty much it i have like a circle where we kind of know everybody's good there's always been a number of projects that you're involved with is there anything in particular that you've been focusing on a little bit more um we did a quick little two song criminal instinct thing that came out i did like a solo death metal thing that came out in april i think and then i'm doing a follow-up to that right now it's called zeus because the last thing that i i knew that you had put out was the eyes of the lord record yeah with bruce from hundred demons yeah that's uh, definitely a record i'm really proud of do you feel like that's going to be an ongoing project uh we technically broke up it's just kind of one of those things where we did what we were going to do and uh played some cool shows and that was pretty much it did two records more of a passion project yeah and he's just like hey, i'm 53 like i don't want to I don't want to play shows anymore. <laughs> and I was like, I get it. He'll be on tour. He's, he hasn't actually done that, I want to say, in five or six years, maybe. I've never been on tour with him as him, like, performing. Yeah. I mean, he's a master of getting shit done. He's the scariest dude on every <laughs> tour. Bruce is from the East Coast, too, right? Yeah, he's from uh, Springfield, Mass. Zing Studios? Is that, was Zing out of Springfield? Uh, I think... Yeah, yeah. I'd been there one time uh, to track some last minute things with uh, Adam D used to work out of there. Yeah, so did uh, that dude Zeus work there too? Or did he do his own shit after? I think he was he was Connecticut because he was in a band with Bruce like in the 90s called Push Button Warfare. Oh, that's the connection. Zeus to the whole, I guess, hardcore kind of scene. Yeah. Metal scene. Shadows Fall and stuff like that. You're from the East Coast, right? Yeah, I'm from Connecticut. And w at what age did you get out to L.A.? Uh, I was 16. My dad, he's been working in television forever, um, but he worked at ESPN in Bristol, Connecticut, and he was always traveling. And somebody gave him a uh, an offer here so that he wouldn't have to travel. And so we just made the move. And my parents were actually divorced, but both came. Was it just you and your brother, or do you have other siblings? I have an older brother as well, but he was in college at the time. Did that brother do music at all? 
No, but he always loved it. He would go to fucking Wu Tang shows all the time and and Raging Against the Machine. And all his friends were kind of like the Connecticut hardcore dudes at his age. He liked it, but he didn't. He wasn't like fully into it. Yeah. You and Colin were more so the ones that gravitated towards like being a part of a scene. Definitely, yeah. You play guitar and drums, play bass. I can play enough bass to get the song done. I'm not tossing extra licks in or anything, really. And you do vocals for Disgrace, right? Yeah, I did. Which came first out of all of those? Drums. Drums did. Yeah, my dad's a drummer. He just kind of sat me down and gave me the uh, the old... And then he was like, you can play any song. So I took that and ran with it and then kind of figured out that literally the punk beat is that just sped up and then got into guitar mostly because nobody in the little town i lived in liked hardcore so it was like i was in these bands playing drums where i didn't give a shit about the songs i just was trying to add mosh parts to these like weird emo songs or something like that so i would write songs by myself yeah and learn to record i was probably like 14 when i just started making my own like i would try to make my own out little albums on cdrs like like this is what this is what the cover would be but i would just be like printing out ms paint shit and it, so i would have these one of one records that only i would listen to <laughs> the tough part whenever you come up with a side project you know you're just at the computer and you're like i'm gonna write a death metal song yeah you're stoked on this like demo and you kind of show your friends and they're like, dude, that's awesome. But then to take it over to the next phase of like, I am going to release this to the public. Sometimes it's enough to just have it for yourself. Yeah. And that's definitely for the Zeus thing. I was like, I'm just going to write some shit that I want to listen to. And then it ended up being kind of cool. So I put it out. Has there been any project of yours that you tracked everything? This is the first thing, but I actually did get a couple guests and things to do like solos on, on the record. And then the next one, I'm going to have some guest vocals. How old were you when you could go on tour? So when I was in high school, I joined this band Crematorium from here that was on prosthetic. And on my spring break of senior year, I went on my first tour and it was Crematorium DSI. And it was like a Southwestern tour mostly. Did you graduate from high school? Yeah. Or oh, Okay, so yeah. you were able to still I finished. Go. I actually dropped out of college, but I but I did finish high school, yeah. Kind of the same for me, except I dropped out of college a, a month into it to Hell join yeah. Asley <laughs> Dying. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was going to community college, so, and I was about like a year and a half in, and I just kept getting, we just kept doing tours, and I was like, I think I'm just going to do this. Were you taking music classes? I was taking recording classes. Well, I was getting C's, so I was like, all right, fuck this. Who do they know? <laughs> yeah. I'm smarter than this teacher. Yeah. Did you do a record with Crematorium? No, I didn't, but I joined as their second album came out. And they had some kid who flew in to do it, but like the drums ended up being pretty fucking programmed from what they told me. Is that? And then the producer of the record, I don't remember his name, came to the first show like the record release show was like us and aborted or something and uh he heard me play the songs and he was like i can't believe that i just heard my programming played live or something like that <laughs> which was pretty funny wow you're even better than the computer yeah <laughs> thanks yeah. yeah so when was the first time you were able to get into the studio and record professionally professionally for real was honestly probably nails on silent death that was the first time I I walked into a studio and was like, wow. Everything before that was like in a friend's bedroom or something or like whatever. And uh, going to God City for the first time was like, all right, this is this is the goal. So you felt like just a moment of like inspiration? Oh, that... every time. Well, and and every time I would be over his shoulder watching, probably annoying the hell out of him. I still had, I annoy the hell out of him weekly. I text him about nonsense or ask him a question on silent death what year was that that was 2010 so we recorded that it was honestly between christmas and new year's 2009 2010 were kurt blue recordings something that you looked up to something oh, yeah. that you kind of modeled i mean your i was style a off huge of? converge fan and i liked all the stuff he was doing at the time i still think that the uh no heroes record they did is like a model recording like that's the ultimate sounding thing is there something about kurt's process of recording that was there anything that you kind of picked up on of like oh that's how I gotta do it every time I went I would see something new but I didn't know what to look for the first time as a kid like I'm like okay this all this all makes sense I see mics and stuff you're kind of overwhelmed I'm definitely overwhelmed and I see like a wall of gear and 2010 I'm like I have no idea what any of that does 2013 I'm like okay I start to see some stuff 
2015, I'm like, I had already studied everything and I'm like, all right, cool. And then that was actually after that record, I went home and started doing um, more analog stuff and buying more outboard gear and stuff. After that experience and you're like, all right, I've, I'm attaining more producer knowledge, engineer knowledge. When was it that like, I'm going to start working with other bands, younger bands? And I was always open to it. And when I was just doing stuff like shitty demos in my bedroom, uh, even like 2005, 2006, I would have like a friend's band co- come over and not charge them. And then they would do like two songs or something like that. I think the first time I ever actually charged a band to record was like 2009. I think I did the World of Pain demo. It's so fun. I went to high school with Noah and... Uh, That's crazy. I did not know that you guys were the same age. He, I think, was two years younger than me, but I always knew Noah as this quirky little kid who's like making the rounds to every social click in the quad. Noah Friend. That's, no, that's not just Noah, a clever name. Noah Friend. <laughs> it's funny. He actually texted me the other day. He was like, dude, this kid on Twitch was playing your songs. You got to get in the Twitch world. And I'm like, not a bad idea. My same response. Not a bad idea, but I'm not as like enthusiastic about figuring out another social platform. It's so much much more than that though because it's not like i'm gonna post a tweet it's like i'm gonna go on there for an hour and people are gonna watch what i'm gonna do whatever that is you can go sit and play guitar for an hour and people will log on and watch you do that so i interviewed nick from the band night versus and his thing for twitch has been like writing songs on twitch with his fans and i told him like you're insane that you're like you're so vulnerable yeah. to strangers in your creative process. Or he's just he's a cataloging material. Yeah. From from other people. But he's like getting kids' opinions on, you know, what what do you think this next part should be and stuff like that. So it's kinda cool to get like a little bit of guidance when you might be hitting a, a wall creatively. I it's guess, not yeah, that, that makes sense. I don't know. It could just be a bad day for me and I'm like, I can't even play guitar today. I mean my friend is a pro wrestler and he, he goes on Twitch and cooks people watch him cook (laughs) and he gets paid to do that the right approach to do is something so random and off the wall that you're not known for possibly i'm gonna look into that you can can cut hair but you don't cut hair or something like that (laughs) the worst haircuts (laughs) so twitching tongues what's been the latest yeah we did an lp about two years ago we slowed down again uh just because we toured on that record before it came out for a year and then after and then so we were just kind of shot we played a fest last year, and then we haven't really played since then. We were supposed to play in May this year. We were going to play um, Drain's record release show. I don't know if you've heard them yet, but they're kind of the new thrashy hardcore band that everybody's really into. They have this crazy like backyard music video that has like 500 kids at it, like jumping off the house and shit. It's fucking awesome. I did their record, and you know, to give them a, just like the the pedestal, we were going to play under them and let them just fucking smoke. And we were really excited to do that, and it just obviously fell through because I don't. I think one of the shows got announced by accident, and then obviously had to get pulled because of COVID. Yeah. Oh, okay. And how did Sean Martin get involved with Twitching Tongues? Because I know he wasn't like original, and then he was out of hate breed for a while, and it was like, what is Sean? Like Sean needs to be in a like a heavy, a band. hard heavy band. He played guitar for Kid Cudi for a couple of years. I'm not even kidding. And he wrote like half a Cold Cade record. He's oh. he kept doing shit. Yeah. And where your wounds? Where you, well, yeah, and that's that's he he crushes on that, and they have their like death metal offshoot band that just put out a record. That's right, too. yeah, yeah. I just asked him to join. Didn't know him, had friends of friends, and he was like, "Yeah, and that was it." Play some Slayer riffs again. Yeah, exactly. We put him in a music video before we met in person. Like we just had him send footage. It was awesome though. He's he's the man, and uh, basically my, our whole band quit, and then I had to just kind of do something crazy to to fill the slots, and then so got him and the best drummer I knew at the time. Who's that? Uh, Kale. He actually plays drums for Ghost Main now. Yeah, crazy. So Twitching Tongues is made up of guitar player that was playing for Kid Cudi. Yeah, and then drummer for Ghost Main. We're very rap affiliated. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you need to get a rap project. Well, I'll, I'll have to die first for sure. Yeah, I couldn't see you doing that. Yeah. This episode of Raise the Bridge is brought to you by STL Tones, which gives you access to thousands of tones from your favorite artists and producers. They carry exclusive guitar plugins, Kemper profiles, and Fractal Audio Axe FX presets. For a limited time, you can get 20% off the Taylor Young Tone Hub preset pack by going to stltones.com and entering in all caps STL Young 20 at checkout. 
The Taylor Young Tone Hub preset pack comes with 46 presets comprised of 30 guitar and 16 bass tones. Be sure to check out stltones.com. So with guitar playing, I guess for heavy music related guitar playing, what were like the earlier influences for you? Uh, Hatebreed for sure. Growing up in Connecticut, they're like Metallica. I love Satisfaction, but I really love Rise of Brutality too, and that's all Sean. So it's it's a little of both. I mean, I feel like he he brought like Jamie's the mastermind, and he you know puts the songs together. But like the right hand of Sean Martin really locked the band in. If I if I had to give credit to the way satisfaction sounds i'd probably give it to steve evitz first but when it comes to later shit it's like you can hear the difference between the playing for sure i remember the first time i saw sean play for hate breed playing a les paul and i'm thinking always it always les paul yeah. and i'm thinking it only had the rhythm pickup and i think he was saying like it wasn't a chambered like les pauls are so heavy as is uh -huh. that they chamber out some weight so it's lighter it's not a such a backbreaker but he was like no nah, this one's not chambered he had like a late 60s one that was that he got when he was a kid it was like the thing that his mom saved up all her money to buy him one time when he when he was a teenager that one actually got stolen but that might be the one that it was and then you were saying sepultura was sepultura is definitely as far as guitar playing like i mean i have a stickered up fucking strat because i always thought his his uh brazilian strat looked fucking sick but even though it was a giant red hot chili pepper sticker on it but like it still looked so fucking hard to me andreas kisser yeah right? yeah I saw Sepultura like not in that heyday, but maybe like eight years ago, and I was blown away at how good they were live. Yeah, they smoke, and, and they they know what they're doing as far as keeping the band going. Everybody talks about how Max you know, and yeah, but like Igor, yeah. he still fucking shreds. There, there's this record Alex where he has this insane solo, and it's like the sickest fast solo I've ever heard. But yeah, their later shit slap. It's it's just fucking insane too, and they have. I think they have more records with the new dude. Not the, the new dude. He's yeah, not, really, yeah, yeah. not new at Derek, all. Derek. Uh, yeah, Derek so, Green. Yeah, yeah. He's not Brazilian, is he? No, he's from Ohio. He was actually in... The most opposite yeah. you can be from He Brazil. was in hardcore bands in Ohio, too. Oh, really? Yeah, he had a band called Outface that I think shared members with one of the Integrity offshoot bands. That's crazy. Yeah. What was your first guitar? I had a uh, like two hundred dollar yes, whatever the James Hetfield looking. It was like an Explorer style, yeah, yeah, but yeah. super pointy. That was the first one. Just I love Metallica. So it was a conscious like, I want that guitar. Yeah, his white guitar that had the eat fuck sticker on it, it always looked so cool to me. But yeah, I got a black one. Uh, but yeah, that was that was number one for sure. That's definitely how I learned is just playing Hatebreed songs or trying to learn Metallica songs just and basically the thing I studied really hard and I still I guess weirdly pride myself in is making sure that the palm mute sounded right oh, some yeah. people half ass it and don't like put their hand down right and I made sure that that thing is a perfect yeah and getting that tight low end yeah. versus like the scratchier or woofy not everyone's chug or palm mute is the same right so you're learning a bunch of those songs and then everyone always asks they're like oh, I got this, you know, piece of crap strat, like Squire yeah. something. And they're like, then I got the holy grail of yeah. guitars. It took me till probably 2014 to get a guitar I was really psyched on. Was that a Les Paul? Yeah, it's my custom that I have right That's here. That's the one. What makes that custom different than others? Uh, Well, this one came stock with a Kaler on it, so it has a tremolo. I heard there was something different about Kaler's to Floyd Rose's. That you can set up each string individually. Like, they all have their own little rollers, and they can come forward or go up individually. So each string, you can change the action and all that shit. And you don't have to chop them and stick them in the fucking block like a Floyd. Because you just put the balls in the thing, which some people say it's not as accurate when it goes back which maybe that's true but they're so like way lighter like to dump a fucking floyd with tight strings on it's hard because those strings are pulling these things are super easy it, i'll let you do it later but you can literally just dump it super easy and uh the thing i won't argue with is that the kaler string locks suck they're awful they sit above the nut instead of on the nut so i do have a floyd lock on it a little hybrid 
Yeah. Because I knew Jerry Cantrell played Kaler's. Yeah. Not that he's doing a bunch of dive bombs and stuff. He would put him in the solos tastefully. Not like yeah. a dive, but like he would do some tremolo shit. I love the idea of Floyd Roses, but yeah. they're just such a pain in the ass. These are definitely far less of a pain in the ass. And they're not like in the back cavity of the guitar. You literally just pop the bridge off and all the stuff is right there. I just did some mods on this other Strat that has a Kaler on it too. Like the back cavity is like empty where the original Fender stuff was. All the junk. Yeah. So what pickups do you have in there? The Les Paul, I have the stock one, but it was, it's an 87. And I think that the stock one at the time were made by Seymour Duncan. Oh, okay. It says Seymour Duncan on it. I took it out initially and put some lace pickups in it, but they were super woofy. And so I put the, I put the bridge one back in. I still have the lace one on the neck. I have some other lace pickups and all the other guitars. So when we did uh, the Poison Headache record with you, we threw a lace pickup. I think it might have been the Matt Pike signature one or something. Yeah, I have one of those on a guitar. Yeah, too. and uh, yeah, I threw that into a Les Paul, and I was like, man, that sounds pretty good. It's, it's nice. That one has a little more twang to it, so it's not like it won't be woofy no matter what, but it's, but it's nice. So Marshall's. Yeah. You're a huge advocate. You could get rid of everything else, and I'd be fine. I've been getting into Mesa lately. But I still ride for Marshall all day. So when a band comes in, hardcore death metal style, and they say, have at it with guitar tones, what's yeah. your go-to Marshall amp? I'll start with an 800 probably. Usually I'll do a Marshall and something else just to get a little different color going on. Because I, I have different tubes in all of my Marshalls. So I have two JMPs. One of them has 6550s in it. The other one has 6L6s. And then I have a stock 800 that has the EL34s. So they have their own different colors. I'll probably go 800 or JMP first. The pedals are, you know, sometimes end up being a big source of the sound. And that's the beauty of the Marshall is they can create anything i feel like what are your more go-to high gain distortion pedals i just got this the other day it's a, a dod super distortion somebody told me they used it on an exit 13 record that i really like which is this weird stoner grind band everything between their songs is like the most annoying shit ever and they have these weird funk parts but the hard shit the hard shit is incredible and they use it on that so i grabbed that and i think that they may have used it on the first brutal truth record as well which is like a colin richardson amazing production I have another modded uh, TS-808 that I like a lot. Do you use the HM2 anymore for things? or I do when they when the band is like that kind of band. Yeah. But if it, if I could never use it again, I, I, would, de I would do that. Because it's just, a, it's like a thing that doesn't really need, like there's just so many. And it's like those are these bands' sounds and these bands exist. So find a different sound. What'd you use for the Poison Headache record? I feel like we used an HM2, but I, I had it with like a, a Pharaoh and like a bunch of other shit. It's definitely in there, but it's not the like focused yeah, yeah. tone. And then I actually just designed this pedal. Prototype? That's a prototype. It's basically just an overdrive and a fuzz that you can control individually to kind of create, like you get the kind of meat of it and then you can add whatever fuzzy sizzle to it. So a little more control with it. Yeah. And it's and it has uh, low controls for both of them. So you can kind of get the get your chunk right. I did it in collaboration with my friend Michael Klein, who he does a lot of one-off pedals and custom pedals for, oh, cool. for people. Okay. And it'll be both of our first like run of pedals. Definitely haven't announced that yet, but I don't mind talking about it on here because you know the more people that know about it, that's cool. So you mentioned Colin Richardson. Uh, was that another producer that you know were kind of influenced or inspired by when you were younger? I think so. Like his his heavy records are some of the heaviest. Carcass heart work, unbelievable. Like the best guitar tone on that record. Straight up insane. And the the brutal truth one's not far behind that one. And then the machine head burned my eyes. You can say whatever you want about the band, but the fucking sound of that record is immense. It's crazy. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with him on a couple of our records. Damn. And just like the nicest and like brilliant, yeah. you know? And it was funny always playing something back in the studio. He'd be in the corner, like air guitaring the part. <laughs> and then he'd like look up and then he'd come over, you know. To he would the, have a revelation. Yeah, he'd have a revelation. And he was just such a very detailed and quirky, charismatic, talented guy. Somebody told me something that upset me about him, okay. that he doesn't do the engineering. He had 
had engineers both times. Wow. Yeah, he's always had an engineer. So he's a producer. But he'll get his hands on like gear. Oh yeah, hundred okay. percent. Always on the gear. So he has a guy who's pushing the buttons and maybe doing the like grunt work, but he understands the signal flow and everything. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, he. It's that makes more me so... feel better. I, w- I was like heartbroken. <laughs> like, wait, he just sits there and tells people what to do. Like, that's I want. I want a dude twisting knobs when he's getting like guitar tones and stuff. Yeah, he's very active with that. It's more so the tedious automation, digital automation stuff. Okay. Bump that up a dB or two. His guys there doing all that. Cool. The computer work, we'll say. That but, makes sense. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I honestly, you just fixed like two years of pain that I've had <laughs> since I heard that. That's what this podcast is it's for. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Kurt Ballou, Colin Richardson, two completely, totally different kinds of producers. Was there anybody else that more so was uh, somebody you looked up to? Steve Evitz, for sure. Stemming from sort of the hate breed records. Yeah. Yeah, Turmoil, Buried Alive, all that stuff. And then his stuff got super clean yeah. once he got out of Trax East, I feel like. But he, he did some like early death metal records that sound fucking insane, too. Was he Ross Robinson's He'd used uh, it. I think engineer? he did a lot of mixing for him. Okay, which you, you wouldn't think would make his style become more polished. It, so the same person who told me that Colin Richardson doesn't do the engineering also told me that Steve, his mixing can tend to be too dirty for him. From there, I was like, you're fucking insane, so we're going to move. <laughs> on from this conversation but because I think that he did go back and do he mixed that Sepultura record that Ross Robinson did recently and that is by far their best shit well, since Max, probably. And it sounds amazing. And then they did one with some Swedish dude who made it sound perfect. And so I was complaining about okay. this to someone who I'm not, I don't want to put. You have to tell yeah. me this someone after yeah, the I will. podcast. And he was like, no, I love this one way more. Like, this sounds beautiful. And I was like, well, that's not what I want. I want beautiful. I want grime and I want it to sound crazy. And the Mediator record sounds really fucking cool. Steve Evitz did some of the Dillinger records. I think too, he right? did all of the Dillinger records. I think that was his thing. Like even calculating infinity? I believe so, because they did that in New Jersey. Okay, and then he yeah. came out to... Uh, he moved West here. Coast. I think he still lives here, yeah. That's actually crazy to think that, yeah, he did all the Dillinger I, I want to say he did all of them, but I could be wrong. But I'm pretty sure that, like, he even does uh, Greg's, like, solo shit now, the new stuff that he's putting out. So he's just the guy. Yeah. Your recording studio, The Pit, when did kind of the vision for this all come together? And My dad actually lived in this house initially with us, and every time I'd play drums in the garage, the cops would get called, literally every time. And so it originally just started as let's build a soundproof room. And we did that. And then it just kind of evolved into a recording studio. And I had already started recording bands. And then we did, you know, routing and and made it functional. From start to finish, it was like two years of building and and i had no idea what the fuck i was doing and he he's kind of a master and he's built studios for other people before. was he technical minded or? yeah he's he he's a tech manager for a tv so he's the guy to yeah. dial everything he in knows how everything works but when he sits down to use it he's like all right what, what do we do so this was a cool project for him to kind of do with his sons yeah it was awesome He actually built a studio in Lexington, Kentucky in the last six years or so. And like Melissa Etheridge is doing all her albums there now. I heard that she is actually killing it on the live stream front. She might be doing it there at that studio. I should probably look that up. That'd be crazy. Yeah. Do you still record? I think when we were doing the Poison Headache record, you were using Reaper? I use Digital Former, but it's like Reaper in that it is not Pro Tools. <laughs> it is. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm a Pro Tools guy, so yeah. I'm like, what? Are, what is this other thing that you're using? Cubase? What? Yeah. What drew you to that? I was starting up probably 2004 using like a real... I started on like a little Tascam 8-track thing, and then I eventually switched over to the computer, which was super intimidating. And that was just what we had, so I used it. They were on Digital performer four and now they're on 10 and i've been at the whole time have you dabbled with logic or any other i have logic too honestly it's just garage band but like better uh i also th- i think logic is stuck at 48 i don't think it goes above 48 and then i have done three records on pro tools now just because i i had to out of here or out of different studios out of different studios oh, okay. i did a record in brooklyn that i had to do it on i was literally like thrown into the deep end like here it is and i was like okay i'm gonna make it work because i think i hit you up about about doing some other record down in San Diego. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it here. And you're like, 
as long as they have digital performer or something. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't no. know. I don't know if, <laughs> yeah. honestly, I've never met anyone else who uses digital performer. Yeah, I don't think I have either. Because every time I mention it, people are like, what the fuck is that? It's built for composing. Um, so oh, okay. it's got a super crazy MIDI interface. And when I'm tracking vocals, it has a built-in thing where it can read the notes. So I don't have to use an external plugin or anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, if I'm fixing a note or something, I literally just go into the track and fix it. It's really crazy. Crazy. Other than that, I just, it's like a comfort thing and I, I fly. The last time I used Pro Tools was actually like a couple weeks ago and I figured out the couple hotkeys that I need to have on the fly and I was able to navigate a full session. Because that could be intimidating, changing DAWs. It's scary. And especially being at a strange studio where you don't know the like signal flow or, or you know, the way things patch. Luckily, they had an assistant uh, that kind of wasn't supposed to come with the session, but he was like excited to be there. So, and he knew the ins and outs of the studio. It was awesome. Obviously, God City was a place you learned a lot. Yeah. But any other studios you've been to that were pretty mesmerizing? Twitching Tongues tracked drums for that last record at Sound City. So that was fucking huge. They were only public for six months, maybe two, yeah, two years ago, or three years ago when we were tracking. I think whoever was leasing it moved out. They got a bunch of partners, put new gear in there. They had a Helios board. and Because uh, Dave Girl's got the Neve, right? Dave Girl's got the Neve. His studio's down the street. Not his home studio. Yes, yeah, 606. I don't know if that's his home studio. Yeah. yeah. It was awesome. That was another thing where the fucking uh, assistant kind of saved the day for sure i engineered by brought mics and you know did some eqing on the board but like had i not had him patching things or he, he actually did run the computer for me which was nice i call in richardson that <laughs> session for sure that's a good callback uh yeah. and then uh the record i tracked a couple weeks ago was at this studio called west alley which is owned by kyle black he's done mostly pop punk stuff he does like state champs and newfound glory stuff like that that's actually really close by too i brought a record there and we tracked it live because he's got a big room which was really nice Back Back to Nails at God City. What is the process for tracking drums? Like the Nails records are sometimes not even 20 minutes long I feel, or like just at 20 minutes. Do you fly by pretty quick? Relatively, for sure. I don't think I took more than two days on any of the records. With setup time or that's just tracking time? That's with setup time. So setup will end up being like first half of the first day probably and then a couple test songs and then by the end of the day I'll track like two or three songs and then the second day i just blast the rest because of the way he works semi-analog mostly analog almost he mixes it in the time that you have booked so as long as you finish tracking you're going to be mixing at the end so i'm just sitting there watching him do it so you leave the studio with pretty much the mix you might make some tweaks here yeah we yeah. leave the studio with probably 80 percent done albums and then we would do a couple notes, like literally listen to it on the flight home a hundred times and then give them the notes. And then you will never be one of us. We had to come here and track like a couple vocal parts because his voice was blown. But he had started mixing before I even sent him the tracks. I've never had that. It's always like months the one as a dying record that colin mixed called the powerless rise that was just one of the records he did mm -hmm. he came out to san diego and it was funny because they didn't know him and his assistant uh ginge martin ginge ford they didn't know how to drive they don't have driver's licenses oh they're english yeah they're english so we had to drive them to the studio every day and the studio it's fun yeah which was <laughs> which is great because we're listening to reference mixes yeah. from the day before and i'm like like going over notes with them I think Allison Chains, that, that first return record of theirs had Good just, record. Yeah, great record. And I remember always listening and we were talking about that record all the time. I was like, this snare just sounds so big and heavy. <laughs> anyway, call, they were mixing out of a, a pool shed turned studio. See, that's what I could never do is get out of my comfort zone and do a record in that. Like, I can track anywhere, but I need to be able to mix where I'm comfortable. Granted two guys from the uk and it's like hey do you want to come out to san diego for a month like, in, fuck this, yeah. in like the summertime get away from this gloom yeah exactly and the thing is that environment that studio environment being like the maiden recording they ended up having to do like a whole nother pass with the mix so it took two months to mix the record oh fuck so they did go home and mix it i think they did they did go back home i think they might have gone to andy sneep studio or something oh, cool something like that that's how our records <laughs> the mixing process i mean you, you end up with unique recordings that way that's for sure yeah you yeah. don't want the shit to be stale just the same shit every time you gotta throw some curveballs yeah. here and there I pretty much ask every guitar player at each podcast their thoughts on Kempers or Axe Effects's digital processors, the amp simulators. 
What are your thoughts on it being such a tube Marshall guy? I'm not a huge fan only because I anytime I try to use it or put it into a record, it just sounds so... I can just hear the falseness. You know, you, you can fake it and it'll sound good, but to me it's not the same. Having said that, I did just work with a company to make my own Kemper packs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it took having your own Kemper pack to, to change your mind. I wouldn't say my mind has changed, and, and I kind of took that and, and put it into what I did, where most of the tones I've heard are like, here's a complete mixed tone. You you put, you plug this in, you put it in your computer, it's going to sound done, and you can push export your shit it's done i'm doing like raw options so it's like here's this amp in this pedal with this mic no processing here's this amp in this pedal with this mic no processing here's a processed combo of the two mics where it sounds like a normal thing so if i want to track a guitar that i want to mix it's going to be easier for me to take this unprocessed one and and run it and and have that be usable so i kind of wanted to have add that little bit of functionality to it and have my own little spin on it part of getting you know a lot of non-believers on board is try to make it work for you for a guy like you yeah and and that's what i basically trying to do and i made sounds that i would use for myself and obviously it's huge and obviously it's good and people like it so i'm recognizing that i am probably to some degree if you look at it from a certain angle wrong but you got to really be at that angle you know the thing is, the technology is only going to get better. And at some point, I mean, do you feel like tube amps are going to be obsolete? Because the technology for tube amps, it's kind of, it's been what it is for a while now. No, because people still listen to records on vinyl. So there is always going to be a nostalgia factor for music until maybe maybe 100 years when we're all dead and, and people are still playing guitars that are like amps. You mean that 100-pound thing that breaks my back all i gotta do is log into the cloud and play guitar being such a sonics enthusiast that vinyl records of digital albums that contradicts itself to a degree yes i actually saw a bunch of people arguing about this recently and comparing like the vinyl sound to the digital master or whatever and say, and being like how could anyone say this sounds better and it's like i don't think anybody thinks it sounds better i think it better sounds subjective yeah it's well it just sounds like it gives you that sense of nostalgia like if you listen to the most fucking digital record ever on a piece of vinyl it's gonna sound a little warmer and i won't say more pleasant because it is uh, subjective but it'll be satisfying in a way like a digital record on vinyl kind of helps balance it out because it's a little not bit sounding as hollow and it's tubey. it's it's smoothing curves yeah and yeah like that. yeah any plans for twitching tongues to do anything coming well, up we've been kicking around the idea of of doing like a ep but not really an ep maybe just a really short lp or something like that but if i say that as a fact then it has to happen so I, we're not sure but we've been throwing we've been throwing an idea around for sure my brother or he plays drums in god's hate where he is kind of the songwriter and th- uh, that band did finish a new record so we're kind of just i don't know if we're gonna sit on it till covid's over but I, right now we're working on it as if we're not what do you play in god's hate i play get gu- i play guitar now i w- wasn't in it previously any plans for Getting back on vocals? The Zeus stuff, I do vocals, but it's just like low grunts and things. My brother and I are working on a kind of new main band that we're going to do, I think, that will kind of take over everything. But it's not far along enough for me to really know how to talk about it. Enough said. So your brother and you, which one's older? I'm older. By how many years? Four. But people say he looks older. He does look older. Yeah. I feel like with Switching Tongues, like his singing voice has more age to it. It does. He sounds like an opera yeah. like old, <laughs> old guy. That was the thing is, is my mom was like, you should start a band with your brother. And I'd be like, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started playing yeah. drums and I'm like, you suck. You should quit. And then he got good and he actually joined one of my bands when he was 16 or something. And then... um haven't really done much without him he's earned his key yeah because i was like that with my brother i was that little brother that was you know was always competitive i honestly credit him for that competitive nature that i have to get better and better because that's good i've got to be better than my brother (laughs) 
And well, uh, and then you finally beat him forever. I, <laughs> I beat him forever. He admitted it one time. Wow. And that's I should have just retired right there. Yeah. Any new albums lately? Obviously, there hasn't been much coming out, but anything that you've been or old albums that you've been stoked uh, listening to? I said I was getting into mesas because I started listening well not started listening to but i really started digesting the coc record uh blind and the guitar tone on that is fucking insane they use this old mesa which is a uh, 50 caliber might you might have a dual caliber but i feel like the dual caliber and the 50 cal are like basically the same and i got a dual cal just to mess with it and it really does have that grit to it without a pedal or anything like that it's it's crazy obviously you're not doing too many records like coc yeah i want to like i could use that guitar tone for more like the sludgy yeah kind of stuff i do have a band coming in january that it may be applicable to which is really cool if you want to check them out they're called age of apocalypse they have a record out right now that's really fucking sick if we're talking sludgy guitar tones uh kirk weinstein um he had a randall mm-hmm and I, when I saw Crowbar play, it sounded so great. And then his amp was like off to the side. One of those, uh, was like the venue where your gear isn't loaded out. It's just to the side wall of mm-hmm. the venue. And my buddy like went flashlight on his phone and took a screenshot of like his settings. <laughs> I think there was like zero high end at all. Oh, I believe that. Uh, they probably had to roll that off just to get any low end out. But, and it was probably a solid state if it was an early one feel like their early shit is all solid state he was using oranges when we toured with them twitching tongues with crowbar or mm-hmm. it was twitchy tongues crowbar code orange and hey Pre. it's fun tour i basically just punished kirk the whole time but he was cool with it. he's a really nice guy i just saw the down live stream yeah how was it he played right yeah yeah that was cool the thing was I was excited for Phil's in-between song banter. None, huh? None because there's no crowd for him. He's got no one to show to. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool. It's like there were like a few technical things, but it was like whatever. The band from the swamp. You, if there's no technical difficulties, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's just cool because they haven't played together in a while too. So they were supposed to do four EPs and they did two, and uh, Kirk quit after the first one. I love that band. How do you feel about the whole live streaming thing to fill the void of touring? I don't think it fills the void properly, but I think it's cool for what it is for sure. And it's, it's something. Yeah. And it's working for a lot. Like, Code Orange is fucking smoking on that. And theirs look crazy. Their, their record just came out, and then they couldn't do any of their touring on the cycle, and it was supposed to be their biggest record. And I think they're making it their biggest record with the live stream stuff, so it's kind of cool. It works out in their favor because they're all technically inclined in different ways. They're a very big DIY kind of... The guitar player does all those weird, creepy digital things. Yeah, and they've got, obviously, a fucking like A-plus management behind them have you done live records like have you tracked any of your records like full band twitchy tongues has a fake live album a fake live album yeah okay it's a we tracked the instruments live and then did the vocals in one pass but then we put a fake crowd in that we were the we were the crowd and it's honestly my favorite record because it's just funny to listen to the whole thing we have like mic give outs where it's like hand the mic and it's just this <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty funny well thanks for being on the podcast taylor and i hope to see you soon man anytime a great time thank you for having me Thanks for tuning in to the Raise the Bridge podcast. For more information, visit philscrosso.com slash raise the bridge.